Uh, my name is Phil Dyack. I'm a counsellor with the ACT AIIA, and I'm very pleased to be able to facilitate this event featuring Philip Williams, who I'm sure needs no introduction, but I'll do this anyway. <laughs> um, just to go through a little bit of uh, Philip's CV, which you may have seen online, uh, he was uh, the ABC's chief foreign correspondent from 2016 until his retirement in April this year. Uh, Philip's career has literally been visible to millions of Australians at some stage or another, and his reports have always been unmissable to any serious follower of foreign affairs and events over the last four decades or so. His reporting from overseas has charted many historical events over our lifetimes, you might say. Uh, for example, from 2008, he was the Europe correspondent based in London, uh, reporting including uh, turbulence in Ukraine, the MH17, the rise of Trump, as well as Brexit. How can we forget? Uh, from 2001 to 2005, also in London, terrorism was a dominant issue, and Philip covered that. He covered the 9-11 attacks on New York, the Madrid bombings, uh, the Iraq war reporting from Baghdad, and Europe's response to that conflict. And he also reported from the Beslan siege. Many of us will remember the siege and its tragic outcomes. During this period, Philip also found time to cover the Boxing Day tsunami from Phuket in 2004. I could go on, but in the interest of time, I'll simply add that previously, as the ABC's Tokyo correspondent in the early 90s and over that decade, Philip covered a very wide range of significant political and economic events and crises in the Asia Pacific region. But wait, we haven't covered a domestic based uh, aspects to Philip's career yet but it is very significant as well as a founding producer of Australian Story and a reporter for other ABC current affairs programs and a one-time chief political correspondent for ABC National Radio current affairs as well. So Philip's career is hard to beat and it feels pretty tiring uh, even trying to summarise it at the Exhausted. moment. <laughs> Exhausted, that's right. Before I pass to uh, Philip, some brief housekeeping matters. Uh, this event will run until 7 p.m. Eastern uh, with the time split between Philip's talk and the remainder of time providing the opportunity for tonight's audience to put questions. I do encourage you to ask questions and for our Zoom audience, please use the chat facility at any time from now on your Zoom page and I'll relay your questions to Philip during the Q&A segment and I'll endeavour to get through as many of those as possible. I should note, also add that this event's been recorded and will appear at a later date on the AIA Facebook page. And with that, it's my great pleasure to welcome Philip and pass to him. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. It's a great privilege to be uh, talking to you tonight. It's, it's also slightly intimidating uh, because uh, you actually know your stuff. You have lived international affairs. You have backgrounds in international affairs. And so I'd better be on my mettle tonight. I can't, I am a generalist. I, I warn you now, I'm a generalist. So don't me, ask me the foreign minister for, uh, for uh, Malawi in 1963's name. I don't know it, um, but I'll do my best. So um, I'd also uh, like to welcome all of those on Zoom. At the moment, you've made a great choice. It's a very cold night tonight. And you can also watch uh, Channel 7 co Channel 7's coverage of the Olympics at the same time. <laughs> so uh, just you choose which one sound you want up at the, any one time. Um, but look, I, I want to talk about uh, something that's dear to my heart, and, and I hope dear to many of people's hearts here. And that is about Australia's place in the Pacific. And look, it's obviously it's a, a very well-worn path of discussion. But I want to be a bit specific about broadcasting because I think uh, Australia is missing a trick here and it's missing a trick that's damaging our future positioning and I think we're, we're not in a, a competitive position, not in the competitive position that we have been in the past and uh, certainly now in these days of great challenge uh, from uh, very big players, uh, we just uh, risk drifting off into oblivion. And I think that we can recover that position, not for a lot of money, but it takes political will. And at the moment, unfortunately, uh, both, at the, both at the political level at Parliament House and at various departmental levels, it's not a priority. And I think that's wrong. I'm hopefully 
present a case that uh, can shift, or not shift opinions maybe, but uh, at least reinforce those that uh, are like-minded. So let me just go back. I was in America for most of last year, a lot of last year. And I was there because of the elections and because we were short staffed, of course, and we had um, various reporters come home because of COVID. So it was a pretty interesting period to be there. It was the peak Trump and then the, the, uh, the exit of Trump, although not quite the exit of Trump that uh, we had, uh, well, envisaged or that the people had voted for. Mm -hmm. So let, I'll give you a context here. So I'm, I'm slipping into the speech here now. So it, it's early November last year and I'm sitting in a hire car with my cameraman waiting for a pro-Trump stop the steel rally to begin outside the North Carolina governor's mansion. A group of women are standing nearby, oblivious to the fact an Australian journalist is listening in. The conversation is centered on Joe Biden's son, Hunter. It quickly escalates from his alleged crimes in Ukraine to a fully fledged and complex web of totally baseless allegations. He's connected to a pedophile ring, which includes the Clintons. Now, QAnon is not mentioned by name at this point, uh, but the plots are straight from the dark world created by the anonymous Q, whoever he, she, or it is. Before too long, they whip themselves into a lather of interconnected conspiracies. The common link is the net, and to a lesser degree, conservative TV outlets like Fox TV. Rationality or truth is in the eye of the beholder. And soon after, soon after the Proud Boys turn up. They, these are fanatical Trump supporters who uh, literally wear their, um, their fanaticism on their sleeves and in their gun holsters. Uh, and it turns out that they were armed and they were itching for a fight that day as there were some anti-Trump um, uh, groups also at that particular location, responding to their appearance. Now, an hour later, the guns have been drawn and fists have been flying and arrests have been made, but it's all based on disinformation, a deliberate attempt to subvert democracy in the USA by telling well-meaning and sometimes gullible people that Donald Trump was the winner and Biden had stolen the election. And in that swamp of mistruth and manipulation, bad things can and have happened, including the storming of the Capitol in early January. Now, we haven't got to the point uh, in Australia uh, that, that the US has, and I'm very glad for that, it's best particularly in the uh, media scene. And I'm talking about the polarization of the media in the US. You're either for or against, and there's not really a center ground. Uh, the Fox TV network, uh, a former Australian, of course, very involved in that, uh, with, with uh, people like Hannity uh, on that network, simply barracked for the Trump side. Unashamedly, blatantly, and uh, with uh, using known mistruths along the way on some occasions. However, on the other side of that, it's like the equal, every force has an equal and opposite reaction. CNN, MSNBC, the other voices uh, in the media landscape uh, seem to be centrist or, or left of centre, uh, became extreme too. When you had commentators like Don Lemon uh, saying outlandish things about Trump, about Trump supporters and the policies. So you really have had a... Uh, a disconnected media scene that was uh, really damaging uh, to the central point of a democracy, which is truth. And whether, you know, whether that was deliberate, particularly on the CNN or MSNBC side or not, um, it undermined confidence uh, in a cohesive society, contributed to a loose, uh, to, to a uh, decoupling of people's trust in that central uh, tenet of uh, the sort of thing that the ABC hopefully provides, which is a reasonable and, and honest report of what's happening. And once that's gone, once that's decoupled, it's very hard to get back together again. So uh, this is obviously just a microcosm of a, of a global problem, this, this event in North Carolina. And, and the advent of, of course, social media and the distrust of mainstream inst institutions 
and the media has created fault lines that are sowing confusion, division and suspicions. Donald Trump's great success was decoupling his supporters from what I call the reliable media by convincing them the mainstream media, i.e. those who did not wholeheartedly support his agenda, uh, that they were fake news. It, he successfully corralled tens of millions of well-meaning Americans and uh, to, to uh, uh, organizations like Fox News, Breitbart News, America First, and a host of other media outlets who sang his songs. In turn, MSNBC and CNN jo uh, joined in pushing the anti-Trump agenda to seemingly ridiculous levels at times. And unfortunately, fair and truthful reporting of the facts suffered in the, as, as a consequence. America was split. A polarization is marked by what TV station you watched, what websites you accessed, and sadly, even who your friends could be. Sure, there were reasonable balanced voices, but they weren't being really heard. Now, my association with America goes back to 1974 when I was uh, an exchange student as a 17 year old. And um, I'm off, I, I do happen to have a winery. I don't have, have the wherewithal here to, to back this up, <laughs> but I'm happy to offer a bottle of wine for anyone that has been to Council Bluffs, Iowa. Any, any takers? No, <laughs> I thought I was pretty safe. So <laughs> that's where I was. It was central, it was, it was middle, middle America, conservative America, reasonable America. And in those days, uh, yes, there were, of course, Democrats, there were Republicans. I happened to live with a Republican family. Uh, but it didn't stop you being friends with somebody from the other side. It didn't uh, uh, determine your social group. It didn't, it didn't determine whether you had a vaccination or not, or whether you wore a mask or not, which is what it became in the United States. So things have gone rather pear-shaped in that country, unfortunately. And at the core of it is this distrust and in some cases actively encouraged distrust of the mainstream media or lamestream media, if you believe what Donald Trump says. So what's this, of course, got to do with, um, with us? And, other than the warning of the corrosive effects of a clear of the loss of a clear and trusted or authoritative voice, uh, what what effect does this have on society? We'll, we'll bring it back to Australia and our region. Back in 1970, uh, 19, uh, 2014, sorry, she's a living of the past, aren't I? Uh, the ABC's Australian network broadcast news, current affairs, sport, and entertainment to 42 countries, with a potential audience of up to. Six, 600 million people. Now, we didn't get 600 million viewers, I'm sure. It was something less, but it was tens of millions, likely tens of millions of people that watched ABC programs, listened to ABC voices uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. It cost Australians $24 million a year, a dollar a year per person, and was funded through a 10-year contract with DFAT, and I'll come back to that later. The Abbott government, in its wisdom, cancelled the contract after a couple of years. Almost overnight, Australia's voice, its soft diplomatic breach, was cut off. Dozens of experienced journalists and producers were suddenly redundant. And a cash-strapped ABC then decided to cut Radio Australia shortwave services and slash the number and reach of language services often offered in the region. At the very time, governments were arguing for an extension of so-called soft diplomacy, the most obvious and trusted source of that power, ABC broadcasts were shrinking and broadcast frequencies were lost. Now, I'm just gonna divert a little way here and I, I, at the risk of um, you know, insulting people here or offending, I, I don't aim to do that, but I, I think there is a message that I have, I have delivered in other forums before, but I think it means it, it, means it needs to be repeated. Um, when it comes to uh, getting the message out, uh, if the ABC is cut off, well, that's, that's obviously a, a disaster. You don't have that means of transmission. But getting the information out of a government department is also uh, become a Herculean task at times and almost impossible task at times. You, there'll be a few people here remember the days when Defence and DFAT had spokespeople. 
And they would come out and confidently front the media and confidently give answers to questions. Now, they mightn't always give the answers the, the media wanted, but they were there. Now, it's call the minister's office or we'll refer that. And being in uh, London, as I was for a number of years, it didn't take long before you know, you've, you've, something has happened in Europe, you want a response from the Australian government, uh, you, it's the, you know, in the middle of the night in Australia, of course, you've got the poor, poor bloody um, defect junior who's got the, uh, the phone, the hotline phone for that night. And uh, you, you wake him, him or her up and say, look, this has happened. We're looking for a response. Uh, I'll, we'll get back to you. I'll, I'll contact people in the morning and we'll get back to you with a, in, a, with, uh, in a couple of, uh, hopefully a day or two. Well, news doesn't wait that long, you know. By the time you got that answer, three days later, uh, it's the issue has moved on, it's gone. That DFAT or uh, foreign affairs voice is lost. It's not amplified. That side isn't given the air it should have. And I would just plead with those involved in public diplomacy, mainly at the political level, um, to be more open, we need the days of Adrian Darge going out in his uniform and fronting the media. Uh, I think the, the, the issue is not so much within the departments, it's within the political offices, because all that power, all that media, all the media inquiries, all is referred now back to the minister's office, and they will deal with it or not deal with it as they choose. And I think it's time to rebalance, give the departments the latitude, give the departments the respect and the trust that they can handle these questions. It used to be done and it used to be done in a very competent way. And I think it's time that that, that was uh, restored <coughs> along with the ABC in the Pacific. So I've, I've diverted there, but the, <laughs> let me just bring it back uh, to DFAT, for example. Now, um, I was in the, the, the wonderful um, entrance to DFAT where the last, the last white paper was presented by Julie Bishop. Now, what an incredible memory that woman has. She can deliver a 20, 25 minute speech without notes, faultlessly. She's quite prodigious. It's a prodigious capacity that she has. But unfortunately, I didn't hear anything about in that white paper about uh, about the soft power uh, expression through broadcasting. The most obvious, I would have thought, issue that would face um, any uh, government looking to project soft power is through broadcasting. It seems a, a no-brainer to me, but obviously I'm very biased and I'm, 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 in, I'm within that, I come from that milieu, but it's, it's something I think that, that was very disappointing uh, that there was that was not even given a passing mention in previous white papers, uh, both for defence and for um, for DFAT have also failed to address that that uh, particular issue. Now, with the DFAT white papers calling for Australia's reach and influence to be extended, um, that that silence uh, really signals to other countries, I think, that we're not interested or we don't care enough or that we don't see that that uh, method of getting Australia's view on the world uh, out to various countries is effective or, or necessary. And I think that's a grave mistake. Of course, the gorilla in our geopolitical space has not been so shy. While the ABC spends a few million dollars a year on international broadcasting, and, and that's mainly bringing reports in for Australia rather than broadcasting out. The Chinese government chips in a lazy 10 billion or so a year on its international media services with its trademark CCTV operation uh, said to be funded to the tune of about a billion a year. Now it's got uh, major hubs, of course, in, in Beijing and uh, Nairobi and in Washington. I have a friend who's a presenter uh, for them. And he assures me that at no time has he ever been pressured 
to uh, slant a story one way or the other. However, I do think if you work for an organisation like that, you don't need to be told. You know the limitations, you know the fen where the fences are, and uh, you, if you tried to jump them, I don't think you'd be working there for too much longer. The BBC World Service has received significant funding boosts within the last couple of years, with the government there describing it as its golden export. More than 300 million people around the world rely on the World Service for accurate news that's often unavailable in their home countries. And that is real soft power in action. The US spends nearly a billion a year on its overseas broadcasting with the flagship Voice of America loud and well known around the world. The Germans uh, 530 million on Deutsche Welle, Japanese a quarter of a billion uh, on NHK, the French around 400 million for its international media projects. Now, are all those countries wasting their taxpayers' dollars? Are they blindly investing billions for little or no return? Or have they come to the conclusion that projecting their voices and their views to all as wide as possible an audience is good for their nations? Or are we right to defund and degrade our regional media voice at a time most others are boosting theirs? And I think uh, you by now know my attitude on that. At a time uh, that reliable, honest and trusted broadcasting to our region is needed the most, our voice is a mouse squeak in a room of trumpeting elephants. That's not to say our, the uber-funded foreign voices are all heard or appreciated or, of course, honest. There would not have been a lot of stories on the recent Tiananmen Square anniversary on CCTV, nor positive coverage of the Hong Kong protests, nor the shocking nor stories about the shocking treatment of various minority groups within China. And the Russian funded RT network is not known for its objectivity or commitment to the truth. I was reporting for the, uh, amidst the wreckage of MH17 shot down over Eastern Ukraine when an RT reporter was standing beside me and uh, he was telling the audience that there was a uh, sound of loud sound of, fight, of fighting nearby but it was a lie. There were no sounds of AK-47s, just birds. Not at, uh, at least there were at that particular point, there was fighting later, but it wasn't at that particular point. It suited the Russian narrative to say the Ukrainians were uh, continuing their aggression despite the disaster of MH17, which Moscow blamed on Ukrainian fighter jets at that point. They had about 15 different iterations of that story. It was willful disinformation supporting a political agenda, but millions around the world heard it and no doubt many believed it. So let's go back to our, our own backyard. Against the background of one of the greatest clashes of economies and ideologies we've ever seen, Australia is investing practically nothing in a media in the very region the battle of the giants is occurring. As other nations invest billions projecting their worldviews via TV, radio and the net, we're largely spectators, not players. There is, of course, and you know, have to acknowledge this one exception. The Morrison government surprised everyone with the announcement of $17 million that would be given to commercial TV operators to place Australian programs uh, in, in the, on TV sets in the Pacific. Now, I'm not sure what the soft power objectives would be met with, with Solomon Islanders <coughs> finally able to access The Bachelor. <laughs> or Samoans able to watch The Farmer Wants a Wife, or the welcoming effect Border Patrol might engender in Papua New Guinea. The commercial operators didn't ask for the money and seemed nonplussed about what to do with it, and the ABC was specifically not invited to that party. The federal government is currently urging Telstra to buy into a mobile, uh, a mobile network in PNG and is seemingly prepared to back the purchase to the tune of, uh, of many tens or perhaps even over $100 million. It's already funded hugely expensive undersea cables in the Pacific, all part of a strategic battle to stymie the Chinese. So much of our diplomatic and defence efforts are aimed at shoring up our strategic and econo economic interests. These costs literally would run into billions. But projecting our voice, our values through the media, old and new, doesn't even attract a mention in a white paper. It's a myopia that's hard to understand. The investment is so low, the cost so effective, 
as to be almost unnoticed in a federal budget. And I would passionately argue that the ABC is the only broadcaster with the depth experience to do the job. And of course, the, treat, the, the uh, obligation under its charter. Uh, perhaps with the, uh, perhaps we should though add, add appropriate programs from other broadcasters in this uh, broadcasting mix. And very importantly, uh, cooperate with, through shared productions, co-productions with the host nations. Uh, the idea of just sending our stuff to them and uh, expecting them to, to lap it up and say thank you very much is, is I think, uh, yeah, arrogant. And uh, we need to engage at a media level with the, with the countries, not just to the countries. Now, I'm not so naive, I am very naive in many occasions, but not so naive to believe that we can easily return to the good old days when Radio Australia and Australia TV had real influence and respect. But our brand, I say ours, because I still can't you know, quite accommodate the fact that I no longer work for the ABC, but our brand is still recognised and still commands attention in, a, in an increasingly crowded and cashed up field. To throw up our hands and say it's all too hard is defeatist and misses an important chance for Australia to reassert its media voice outside our shores. And how the money is found and structured, well, I'm not actually in favour of the previous DFAT model. As a journalist, I have a bit of a problem with the idea that our work is managed and possibly influenced uh, by a department, a very, albeit a very good, a fantastic department. My son works there, uh, but it is beholden to the government of the day. I think it needs a specific budget added to the ABC's funding, ring-fenced and managed by the corporation. Of course, governments are sometimes upset with the stories we broadcast, which at times may not mesh with their policy objectives. But the power behind the ABC's work is its credible journalism. We don't always get it right, but consistent polling says we are the nation's most trusted broadcaster. It's that reputation that amplifies our voice way beyond the millions spent by less credible but better funded foreign broadcasters. But to be heard, we need to be in the game. It's not too late, but we need to get going soon. Now going right back to that car park in North Carolina, the absence of sane and balanced sources of information that are believed and listened to have left the US divided and weakened. In its own tiny way, it shows the power of disinformation and the dangers that evolve when truth is discarded. We're in the middle of a geopolitical contest that will define generations to come. Our voice needs to be heard and trusted beyond our shores. If we don't try and buy back into the information race, we risk irrelevance. And at times like this, it's a mistake we simply can't afford. Now, before I, before I wrap up, which is pretty much now, I'd just like to acknowledge the hard work and dedication of the people behind the Australian Asia, Australia Asia Pacific Media Initiative, an organisation committed to reawakening Australia's voice in the region. And uh, by the way, they estimate a proper TV uh, service uh, in the region would, be, would need funding of around about $75 million a year, which is a, a couple of days of uh, cost uh, re, re, revamp uh, for uh, our um, future submarine project. Um, sorry, that was a cheap shot, but you know, <laughs> I'm a journalist. We're indebted actually to the tireless efforts of people like Jemima Garrett, who has devoted countless unpaid hours to the cause, simply because she cares. Ian McIntosh, former ABC and CNN executive. Uh, and I have to say, and I'm very proud of this, and my wife, Carolyn Jack, who was media advisor to the then International Development Minister, Senator Ferravanti Wells, helped put those views set front and centre on the political agenda. And I'd also like to acknowledge the great work done by various authors at the Lowy Institute. Um, it all adds up to, I think, uh, a call to arms, a, a, a call for uh, the government to look beyond what, however it may feel about the ABC, any government at any one time, uh, uh, and look to the national interest. And the national interest is firmly served mm -hmm. by having uh, the ABC or an organisation which incorporates the values of the ABC broadcasting into, the, uh, into our region and having uh, that region responding uh, to our broadcasts and, and feeding into those broadcasts as well. It's time 
Uh, there isn't much time to waste. We're competing against billion dollar operations. We're talking a, you know, a few $10 million. It's small change in this, the big scheme of things. And uh, I would encourage all of you, if you feel the same way, uh, to uh, talk to those uh, that matter and uh, which, which, whatever pressure you can exert, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Philip has said uh, generously that not only can we, should we ask questions about these important issues, but if you have anything uh, that's um, uh, top of mind from his long career that you're just dying to ask a question <coughs> about, uh, which could be in any location or any of the issues that he's uh, covered over time, feel free to do that as well. Um, are there any questions? Over there. Uh, if you wouldn't mind saying uh, your name and who you're from, everybody at the speak, and we're using this microphone here, so please speak clearly. Uh, hi, my name's Peter, um, Peter Holland. Uh, I'm, I'm just a, an interested person, not involved in international affairs at all. Um, just seems like over the last four years, specifically under Trump, in the populist age, there seems to be uh, a lot of hostility and cynicism towards experts in any field, uh, especially the media. And I was wondering if you personally witnessed a change over the last four years in people's attitude to you directly when you, you had to deal with people in your in the course of your investigations or... Yeah, very much. I, that's a very good question. Uh, yes, is the answer. Um, we're viewed with far more suspicion than we were, uh, especially when you're in America, especially if you tell them I'm from ABC and you're in a Trump camp. You very quickly have to say uh, Australian television. That's what you say, because ABC is loaded uh, with your you're from the enemy media camp uh, from this American Broadcasting Corporation. It's a very uh, quick distinction you learn to to use because you could be met with uh, a very hostile response. Yeah, we've we've um, you know we've seen a lot of open hostility towards us, uh, threats of violence. Um, that particular rally I was talking about, I took a, I took a strategic decision um, to uh, uh, introduce myself to the Proud Boys because I wanted them to know who we were uh, as neutrals. I didn't want them to feel that we were hostile or we were with them. I wanted them to, feel, to know we're, we're outsiders. And I explained very clearly, we're from Australia. We're just observing what's going on. So we were filming them um, and as I say, that in, end up, ended up uh, nearly with shootings at that particular day. But there was a, a group of anti-Trump uh, protesters across the road. Now, as, as a matter of course, you would want to go over and talk to them and get their attitude. And when I went over and I said, oh, you know, what do you think of these guys? I said who I was. Uh, they refused to talk to me. I said, why won't you talk to me? You're with them. Because I'd been seen filming with the Trump supporters, they instantly assumed I was a Trump supporter uh, and not just a journalist doing my job. And that reflects the polarization of the country. And I think you're very right. Being a journalist is far more difficult these days and far more dangerous these days. Over here. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, Robin Fitzsimons, uh, AWA American from Sydney. Um, given all the advocacy which you have just described, what do you think is the principal reason or the reason for the government resisting the sort of action which you've been taking? And I suppose in that con in, if I can also bring a specific situation, i.e. the Hong Kong situation, where the media is being progressively constrained, whether it's RTHK, whether you know, it's the Jimmy Dyer situation, and particularly in the schools, what they, the upcoming generation is going to be able to learn. Uh, do you see a particular case for the Australian media being heard there in a way that they probably couldn't be heard in mainland China? Well, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's become uh, a very sad place. You know, unfortunately, it's become uh, the, the, this island of democracy and of, um, of freedom is has been effectively shut down 
and that's happened in a very short time. Uh, it's actually not surprising it's happened, I don't think, uh, given the, uh, the level of protest and the, the fact that if they'd won that battle in Hong Kong, uh, the government in, China, in Beijing would have been seen to be very weak and they couldn't afford that. Um, but yet yeah, never, never have we needed an Australian voice or, or voices of reason and truth in a place like Hong Kong. We've never has that voice been needed more. And I, and I, and this is a very good example. Um, it's getting very difficult to report, you know, from Hong Kong, as you know, and it's going to become increasingly difficult. And, you know, the, you know, what's happened to the ABC in, in, in on the mainland, um, effectively, uh, Bill Bertels was expelled uh, with various threats uh, applied over him. Um, uh, Matthew Carney, who was the bureau chief beforehand, uh, was uh, hauled in and threatened, uh, and uh, his 15-year-old daughter was threatened with 10 years jail over some paperwork that they said was, was not done properly. Um, you can't get the ABC voice, of course, projected into China now. Uh, that's, that's a lost cause. But uh, it, it emphasises the need for the information to be out there. And even for the expats as well. It's not, it's not, it's, it's a side sort of benefit. But I think the expat, expat population needs, needs that connection too. And now, obviously, you can say, well, yeah, they can go on the net and they can, you know, reach the ABC and what, whatever. It's not the same as having uh, specific broadcasts that are tailored uh, to your region and to your, your particular um, country or, or territory. And I think that's what's lost. And, uh, you know, we were, we, were the, we were a big deal and we still are in the Pacific. But I, I fear that's going to slip away the more that we have, um, the more our, our media voice is, is reduced or, or not, not challenging those other very large, very powerful media voices that are filling that void. Thank you. Uh, Heath? Thanks, Phil. Uh, Heath McMichael, Branch President. Uh, Phil, I wonder if I could get you to just to comment on the idea that uh, with more uh, countries in our region uh, uh, somewhat opening their media, uh, whether there's a role there for capacity building in those uh, uh, places uh, sure. and, and, and how that might be affected. Uh, yeah. Is there a role for the ABC on its own or with other media outlets or with uh, Australian government in some way? How would that happen? Well, look, we do have uh, we do have uh, an organisation that does uh, assist with training, and that's that's a very long-standing um, uh, organisation <coughs> that's assisted in in places like um, uh, PNG and uh, Solomon's and uh, Vietnam, uh, and what. Generally, what that what happens is that the consultants from the ABC or ex-ABC people like me go in and, and help with training, and, you know, training in, in production and writing and and uh, just the you know sometimes the, the crazy idea that we tell the truth. You know, you go out and you actually find the find the story and you, you broadcast it. Um, that again is 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 an element of soft power. By the way. I know I use that word soft power a lot, but I don't actually like it very much uh, because as a journalist, I don't like to be seen as a part of a you know, government <coughs> initiative or government strategy uh, to, to gain influence. I'd just like to see my, my work out there and, and that I'm just doing my job as a, as, a, as a journalist. But the reality, it is a projection of soft power. And, um, you know, I think, if, if you go to, if you go back in time to say Fiji and the various coups there, and Peter Kay was ma managed to smuggle out tapes uh, of what was happening there. And um, that was then broadcast via RA, Radio Australia, into Fiji. Many people in Fiji were then aware of what was happening and the region was aware of exactly what was happening. And for that, he, he, was, he suffered a mock, mock execution. Mm -hmm. He was dragged out of his hotel room, a gun put, uh, taken out the back, uh, a, a gun put to his head and a trigger pulled. There was no bullet in it. Um, even back then, 
uh, you know, there were pressures. There were moments, uh, you know, for all of us that uh, along the way. But um, you know, this this idea of uh, trying to subvert the the, the truth and, and and try and stop the media is a very old one indeed. Uh, for example, in '92, anyone in any diplomats in Bangkok in early '90s, by any chance, any around here? Anyway, there was a a people's uprising at Bangkok, and it was very bloody, and it was you know suppressed in a bloody way. And I was there at the time. Of course, the only way in those days we had no no net then was going to the TV station and you satellite your story out. Well, of course, that's the first thing that shuts. So the government thinks, right, good. The story's over from an international perspective. We don't have to worry anymore. But this is the, the old the old fashioned pigeoning system, as we called it, was go out to the airport and uh, find a line that of people going to Australia, hopefully a Qantas line, and you have a tape uh, and say, excuse me, would you please, would you mind taking this to Sydney with you? When you get to the airport, there'll be somebody with a sign and take it, take it from you. We'd really appreciate that. Can you imagine that now? You know, <laughs> what? You ask me to take drugs, or <laughs> I mean, it just wouldn't happen now. But and, and in fact, Qantas crew used to do that for us as well. Sometimes the pilots or the or the or the, uh, the attendants. So, yeah, those were old methods of getting around the system. Of course, uh, you know, in the current environment, a country like China has enormous resources and means of blocking information. Uh, North Korea, of course, is uh, virtually hermetically sealed, as we know, although you know, we, we also know that South Korean um, soaps are the, mo the, the hottest contraband item uh, flying around uh, in North Korea, um, where it's always a cat and mouse game, but it's, it's only the game, of course, isn't even played if you're not out there in the field. And at the moment, uh, in terms of our responsibilities in the region, and I'll come back again to the charter of the ABC, uh, we really need to get out there and be seen and put our voice out there. I mean, what do we know about the world? We, we might largely know about it through the media. You know, very few other source of information. You'll, you'll know, you'll have friends, uh, he'll tell you stuff uh, what, you know, that might be on the scene, but largely we're dependent on journalists to tell us the state of the world. If Australian journalists aren't telling the world you know, our view or how we see it or what we saw and, and how it developed or whatever, then we're irrelevant. And I'm afraid that's largely where we are now, and especially in an environment where the media is under such enormous financial pressure mm. and bureaus have been shut you know, here, here, there, and everywhere, and, and uh, the ABC has 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 done that too. Uh, you know, used to have a, a Moscow bureau, a, a Brussels bureau, um, a fully fledged bureau in in Singapore. Uh, things have changed, and, and we we have to obviously uh, run with that as well. And there's not endless money, and I I I, I agree with that. But this is such an important moment in our history. You know, this is not just sleepy Pacific, you know, um, quiet ASEAN, it's never quiet. Uh, this, this is the time of the, of the great struggle uh, between ideologies and between economies. And we're not, we're not there. We're not, we're not a part of it. Okay, over here and then Des, and then up the back. Well, yeah, nice and clean. I'm here as an interested observer, although I, I agree with this guy that I work for a front every day. But this is just. I didn't. I didn't mean to be uh, nasty to you. <laughs> as I say, my son works so, there, you know, so. Then so maybe he won't after tonight. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I just wanted to make a comment to reinforce the urgency of what you're saying, just from a, a normal observer. If you'd know, a lot of people would probably know that. Um, on social media in the Pacific, Donald Trump had a lot of supporters. Um, he looked at uh, Facebook and other, and Facebook being, you know, their main kind of platform because everyone gets it. You know, I think it's hooked up to um, uh, to the phone services that everyone gets because it's pretty easy to get Facebook too. So you know, um, and as more and more sort of people in major centres like PNG, Prince of Suva. Um, uh, made more of the uh, Mandy side on um, the level in Fiji, et cetera, et cetera, up here, get access to social media because their phones are cheaper and they get you know, online. 
um, then you get this tide of exactly what you're talking about, um, information from all over the world, some of it not very helpful. Um, and we see this again now with COVID-19 and resistance to COVID-19 uh, vaccinations. Um, PNG, classic example, um, how many people like Australia, how much AstraZeneca is lying around going off because no one will take it. Yeah, but it, it's like, oh, all this is just to reinforce your message that it's, it's really urgent now. Um, yeah. And the problem is getting worse by the week. Yeah. People are probably, you could even be dramatic and say people are dying because of this now. Um, you know, I'm a former journalist, so maybe I'm beating that up, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll yeah, get the headline out of that. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree entirely, and uh, and you know that, that's the game changer is social media, and that mm. that has has um, uh, just fragmented the source of information. And you know, uh, I'm sure I'm guilty of it too. You you choose the information that fits your worldview. And if, you know, if something's presented to you in a palatable and attractive way uh, in, and you're uh, in a, uh, you know, you're in up here or wherever and um, you get information saying that they're putting chips, microchips in the, in the vaccination, uh, then, you know, you may, you may have a bit of hesitancy there and that can kill. And I, I don't think that is an exaggeration. I mean, you know, we're, we're lucky, you know, not knock on wood it's so far you know we've avoided the worst of it um but you know what what my my fear is uh that um and there'd be no satisfaction in this is that the people that are going to be hurt the most are the people that have resisted uh the the vaccination message for example and and that, that that's something that can be um you know uh applied across the pacific across southeast Asia, across the world really but within our sphere of, of, of influence and interest, um, you know, that's a, a pro-vaccination message is something that I think uh, would, uh, would be very helpful. Uh, I don't mean that as a propaganda thing, I just mean it as a straight fact. You know, the sort of stories that uh, you see with um, Norman Swan, um, you know, uh, which could be tailored to a Pacific audience. Um, that, that could go a long way, you know, yeah. to, to helping People decide what's good and bad. And as you say, um, there are bad actors out there. <laughs> there are there are bad, um, you know, national actors who go to extraordinary lengths and, and have poor and uh, amazing resources <coughs> into this information. And you know, we saw we saw it with, of course, the 2016 election in the United States. Uh, that's where it really sort of was really noticed. You see it all the time in places like uh, Ukraine and um, you know. It's it's a worldwide problem, um, but again, if you're not reacting to that, if you're not countering that, if you're not if your voice isn't of reason, uh, isn't out there, then all you can do is talk about it. Yeah. Before I pass to Des, I'll just mention that we have around forty people online, and they must be so mesmerised they haven't asked any online questions yet. <laughs> Des. Uh, I think there's a good, there must be a big run or something at the moment on the on, on Channel Seven. I think Peter Peter Bowl is running. I think. <laughs> I'm Desmond Woods. I'm one of the councillors here at the ACT branch. And picking up on your very good point just now, not only are we not hearing the ABC and seeing it in the Pacific, what people there are seeing from Australian television, commercial television, is in many cases highly inappropriate culturally. Uh, there is no filter on sending married at first sight or rather trivial and suborning rubbish to church-based traditional communities who in many cases the adults find it offensive the young people find it enthralling yeah. but that's not the point we should have a better voice than that sort of nonsense going out as though this is what australians most care about well, there, there was a time when um, uh, Australia, before, well, in between the first iteration of the ABC's international broadcasts uh, and the last one, uh, Channel 7 had the contract. And, you know, we had Home and Away. And you know, as you say, these are not necessarily, these are values, of course, these Australian programs and values. But not all of them project something that uh, is necessarily, as you say, culturally sensitive mm -hmm. or useful or even entertaining. 
and sometimes downright offensive. Yes. I understand <laughs> so, the Broadcasting Corporation of New Zealand, uh, which has a much smaller footprint than Australia used to have, yeah. is nevertheless looking at what it's sending out and doing it with some degree of, of diplomatic skill and caution. Yeah, well, look, you know, not to be too competitive about this, but isn't it galling that New Zealand is, little New Zealand is doing a better job mm. of broadcasting into the Pacific mm -hmm. uh, in some respects than Australia? And that's not a criticism of the ABC. Mm. It's a, just an, an observation that they are on the money with their Pacific reporting. Uh, and they have, um, you know, their Pacific uh, uh, structures and reporting uh, lines are uh, pretty well preserved. And, uh, you know, we, we have lost a lot of good people over, over, over time, unfortunately. You know, we've, it's, it's corporate knowledge that's very hard to recover. But it's not impossible. And if we don't try, well, there's, I don't see any doubt that we will succeed. But um, we don't succeed unless we actually start. I could just do a double header here. I was in Europe when the Eastern Bloc came to an end. And one of the things I remember is people coming through to West Germany, as it was then, and saying, it is so good to see the people who've been giving us their information all these years. Yeah. Because, of course, what they were actually doing was listening in to Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, the BBC, um, all the European channels that could be seen in the East. There was one particular area where the channel was very weak and the locals called the people who had to live there, the Valley of the Blind, because they couldn't get the channels <laughs> that they were getting. And I'm convinced that we do more good than we ever know by just keeping on telling the truth. It's got a way of getting around. People want to hear something other than the propaganda that's being <laughs> spewed out by their own corrupt uh, and uh, self-serving governments. I, look, I agree entirely. And, and, and I, you know, I th th this is, um, it's, it's not easily measured, as you say. You, you know, it's hard to measure success. Uh, but undoubtedly, the fall of the Berlin, uh, of the wall in Berlin was contributed by mm. free and fair reporting and, and, and the East Germans hearing mm. what's happening. Um, it's, doesn't give you an immediate uh, political hit when you have a, a, an ABC or whatever uh, international service. Um, you don't necessarily see instant results. It's, it's a slow um, you know, build and it, it's, it takes time. But I, I would not be convinced that the BBC uh, would, would have added another 70 uh, million uh, pounds uh, mm -hmm. to the to the world service and described it as their um, in, in glowing terms as their greatest export mm -hmm. if they didn't see you know uh, a return because everywhere you go everyone knows the BBC world service anywhere you go in the world we rebroadcast it on the ABC mm -hmm. you know on the weekends we hear it um, it's it's a, a well-known and trusted brand and the ABC has a similar um, uh, level of trust in it, mm. but it doesn't matter how trusted you are. If you're not there, memory fades and certainly influence fades very, very quickly. The proof of what you're saying is the degree of uh, effort that corrupt and, and brutal governments go to block it. To s exactly. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, I, have, uh, I have been in um, uh, Pyongyang. And very fortunate to go there because I, I couldn't get a ticket to the moon. So I just, <laughs> it was the next more, most exotic place on, on the, in the solar system. Um, and of course, you know, they famously have their, have, you know, one channel. It's, it's sold. It's uh, sold, soldering iron that has uh, fixed that. Um, and and the, people find ways to get around that, of course, but at great risk to their lives. You know, if you're, if you're caught uh, listening to a foreign broadcast, you're off to a work camp or, or worse, mm -hmm. and, and so is your family. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, we, we sometimes, I think, take for granted the, the media freedoms and, and, and the effect and the power that they can have. Um, but as I say, politically, it's, it doesn't win you an election. Mm -hmm. It doesn't affect anyone's vote, really, except mine. Mm -hmm. um, and 
at that level, I think it's difficult to get that across the line. But as I say, I think the funding model uh, should be uh, a separate, separate funding for this organisation managed by the, by the corporation, uh, direct funding from government, but on a triennial or, or even longer basis so that you can plan for the future and not be uh, subjected to the sort of um, hit that happened in 2014 when a $250 million contract was just torn up. Young gentleman with a dark coat at the back and then Amanda. Uh, hello, I'm Glenn Parks, student at Narrabunda College. I was just wondering- um, Fellow, fellow Narrabunda College. Oh. Well, <laughs> high school in those days. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering um, what role do you think this projection of soft power uh, may have had, or the lack of it, uh, may have had in the conflict in Myanmar uh, recently with the uh, deposing of Oh, I've got her name, yeah, sorry. yes, I'm going to shoot you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, um, that one's a bit that that one's tricky mm. because um, mm. she was always surviving uh, by the I, sh I, I shouldn't use the word graces mm. uh, of the the junta, um, but she was always at risk of losing her liberty and her position at any time, um, and I'm not sure how much reporting from the outside would have affected that particular outcome. Uh, but certainly the fact that you have uh, journalists uh, uh, and particularly the BBC um, on that case constantly, uh, and that you have still from afar, you still have uh, pressure exerted via um, domestic ABC um, programs uh, about, about her situation and of course the Australian her Australian advisor, his situation, um, that certainly signals to the, and I'm sure these reports are sent back via the embassy here, uh, that uh, this, this is a problem. And that can only, you would hope, uh, help their individual situations. As for um, uh, fundamentally changing the dynamics of that particular uh, situation, I don't, think, I don't think the media would have done that. Um, because for all the uh, coverage that those uh, protests got, it didn't end well. Uh, and sometimes it just doesn't, no matter mm -hmm. what public, you know, publicity. And that's, you know, part of, part of my history is sometimes reporting on uh, unremittingly dark stories that don't have happy endings. So mm -hmm. sometimes they do, but uh, how are we going for time there? We've got time for another question. Okay. <laughs> Over to you, Amanda. Yes, Amanda Lynch from the Council, AMIA. I'm uh, just following up with Phil's uh, suggestion about uh, some of the highlights of your career, which has been very long and, um, and uh, interesting. And we're aware of some of the uh, <coughs> some of the different countries and issues you've covered, but there are others. And uh, just in terms of, I'm reading Bill Bertel's book, which is good, and he talks about some of the heroes. The, uh, the lawyers that represent dissidents in China and putting their own lives at risk and how much he admires their courage and just interested in, yeah, maybe two or three sort of uh, stories from your career, but also are you planning a book as well? <laughs> <laughs> I have been asked this. I'm, I'm the only one of my generation that has not written a book <laughs> and I've resisted it simply because I didn't want to add to the uh, library of I heroically did this and then I heroically did that books and um, that's not a criticism of my my colleagues not at all uh, no I just I just haven't found the pathway yet um, um, I'm still thinking about it uh, but I think I, I think the world can just struggle by without a book from me somehow <laughs> I know it's hard to imagine um, but highlights you know it can't, it, I mean there it, it I'm often asked this question, like favourite stories or whatever, and it's a bit like sort of picking favourite children, you know. Um, there have been so many of, you know, very dramatic and dark stories that I've covered. Um, you know, you, you're, you're lifted in a, in a weird way by the spirit of uh, um, the revolu last revolution in Ukraine, uh, that these guys with slingshots and tires for protection um, took on the armed state and a number of them died doing it. 
and and they persisted in the middle of the winter um, in what you know looked like medieval forts made from from timber you know scrap timber and snow uh, that's an inspiring moment uh, it's uh, the human spirit that comes through in very small ways when you see uh, a uh, a man um, digging for his children who've been killed in the flash flood in, in a place called Ormoc. And he addresses you as sir. And it's that power imbalance that reminds you, you know, of your privileged position in life at his most desperate moment. And the, the sense of impotence and humility that you have to feel at that moment. It's the young 19 year old girl who with a, with a nine month year old baby with terrible hydrocephalus, which is water on the brain and forcing the eyes in one direction, who is clearly going to die in a refugee camp uh, in the aftermath of the Mount Pinatubo explosion in 93 or whenever it was. And um, that, that moment where you are confronted, not just as a journalist, but as a person, as a human being, well, we've, we've filmed this, this poor person in this situation. What do we do? And that moment you decide, no, bugger it, we're going to do something about this. And picked her up and a couple of her friends and her baby and took her to Manila to a hospital to have uh, an operation, stents uh, put in to relieve the pressure on the brain. And then many years later reflecting, well, you know, we played God that day. Did we actually do the right thing? Because um, did we actually burden that poor young woman whose husband had died, by the way, uh, with a severely uh, disabled child, which she would have no means to, to properly bring up? It's, it's it, these little, these moral dilemmas you know, crop up time and time again. And that those situations where you can make a little bit of difference on the day, but not necessarily change the outcome, um, or perhaps even make that situation worse. You, know? um, you have other you know, moments where it actually does work, where we're in Haiti, when you know, terrible scenes of, of utter destruction, you know, no law, no government, uh, and most people's homes destroyed, and finding a, a, a little kid, eight years old, outside the compound we did live in and was still standing, completely naked, without parents. Now, his father had been in jail and didn't know, we didn't know whether, we found this out later, the mother had died. And what do you do? So again, we, we, we intervened in that particular moment and went back a year later and found him in great health and with his relatives. Uh, and, you know, that, that was a, a positive, you know, you can come away and say, well, that was a good thing. That was a good thing we did. Um, but you are, you know, it's, it's a job that actually does test you and test your uh, ability to, um, to keep going at times. You know, you have you know, the, the, the Beslam uh, uh, story was, a bro you know, broke me for several years. It took me a while to recover. I was suffering from PTSD, although I didn't know it at the time. Um, you had these uh, issues, you know, and, and I, I sometimes get asked, well, how do you deal with that? Um, I think I'm just bloody lucky. I was just born with a basically optimistic attitude and, you know, a, a hope that the next day will be better. Well, sometimes it isn't. And, and as I said before, you know, sometimes there's no happy ending and it's unremittingly dark, but, but there's that, there's a, for some odd reason, um, I keep coming back to that. Also, I, I'm very glad uh, that unlike some of my colleagues, that I have uh, a pretty well-developed sense of fear because fear is your great protector in those environments. And if you, um, for me, if, if I'm with a cameraman, for example, in a war zone and he's not scared, I don't want to be with him. Because fear is, fear, 
fear tells you to duck, fear tells you to run across that street and get behind that wall in a hurry. And uh, the, the ones with the bravado, the, the, the brave are often the ones that uh, you write, you're, you're reading or writing about the next day as a casualty. So that, I think I've just rambled uh, incoherently <laughs> along a very long path and we must be getting close to time. We are. And um, no, not at all. Um, there's very poignant observations there that um, do underscore the importance of uh, storytelling and truthful storytelling, which I think in turn underscores uh, the case you've made very persuasively tonight about the importance of Australia telling its stories in the Asia Pacific region in a world that uh, I suppose has that malaise of truth ain't truth and the post truth. Um, the alternative facts. Al alternative facts that are around us. So thank you very much for sharing your time and your observations with us tonight. It's been fantastic. Uh, and on behalf of everybody, thank you. Thank you so much.